Hello, everyone. We are now beginning the presentation part of today's 2019 League of Women Voters of West Virginia convention. And this is Angie Rosser. Our, our, we're honored to have this speaker here today. And we've worked a lot with this organization, so we're really looking forward to hearing you speak today. So I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you all for inviting me to be here. I've learned two things already about the League. Uh, one is if you come to the convention, you will eat very well. We just had a wonderful lunch, those of you online that you just missed. Sorry about that. We, um, meringues, ice cream, all kinds of things. The other thing I learned is that this is a group of highly informed people um, when it comes to civic engagement, the policy issues that the state are facing. I mean, and, and you all are, are, you know, covering the spectrum of all kinds of issues. And I want to say how much I appreciate that and how refreshing that is to be in a room of highly engaged people. So this is going to be fun uh, to talk with you all today. Um, as Jonathan said, I'm Angie Rosser. I'm the executive director of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. We are a statewide nonprofit organization, been around since 1989. Here's our mission about conserving, restoring West Virginia's exceptional rivers and streams. And when, um, as we've evolved into the organization we are today, we recently took an examination of not only, you know, thinking about our mission, but, you know, what is this world we want to create and how does, how does our work uh, contribute into this larger uh, vision? One thing we recognize is that clean water is the foundation of life. So the fact that we are focused on water is a pretty big responsibility when all life depends on it, right? Um, the other thing we, we believe in is that every person, no matter where you live, no matter what economic class you're in, everywhere in West Virginia, every person should have the right to enjoy and use clean rivers and streams. When we think about our work, we, we also think about in the context of it's really about people and about community. So when we envision what we want community life to look like in West Virginia, and when clean water is part of that equation, we see a community life that is centered on sustainability, health, shared prosperity, that honors a relationship be between people and the natural world and celebrates that relationship. So yes, we're talking about water, we're talking about environmental issues, but those are really people issues and, and are about quality of life and the future of, of what we want for people living in West Virginia. How do we do the work we do? Um, well, first, <laughs> and they're recognizing this guy, uh, Evan Hansen, who's in the room, who I'm going to uh, 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 try to get through my slides first because I want you to hear his perspectives on, on the water policy issues too because for a long time um, Evan has worked uh, with West Virginia Rivers Coalition. Um, he spent a good amount of time with us as our science advisor and that was has been very important to us um, to make sure that the work we do, especially around policy, is firmly rooted in sound science and good science. And we're going to come back to some current examples of how this is playing out um, in our West Virginia state legislature. The second thing that we've realized is so important, and I heard you all talking about this this morning, is, is people, bringing in people power, and how do we grow out our constituencies? How do we become my, more diverse in our representation so that we are, that every you know, person again and, and throughout the state, that their interests are being represented in the advocacy work we do. Because advocacy only works, I'm gonna, we're gonna do a little, run through a case study where we saw this work extremely powerfully, is when people are active and people are involved. And the last thing, you know, we think about in terms of how we frame our work and the story of the role of water in West Virginia is to make sure we are, um, you know, thinking about tomorrow, thinking long term, and thinking about how water, rivers, and streams are are going to be part of our story, have been part of our story to this day, but moving forward, and what that looks like. Um, and it's and it's an interesting kind of economic transition, if you will, work that the state is facing, and thinking about how our lands and special waters like this, like the Blackwater Canyon, the New River Gorge the Gully River that attracts 
thousands of people from all over the world to experience the water resources we have here and, and the kind of outstanding experiences they provide. At the same time, you know, we're struggling with this kind of reputation, right? Where um, West Virginia has a reputation for pollution and water problems. Um, this came, uh, this picture was on the heels of um, the water crisis, which I'm gonna just walk through that story with you because I think it is very instructive and remarkable in different ways. And being that we're, I guess, five years out from January 9th, 2014, when 10,000 or more gallons of a coal cleaning chemical called MCHM leaked out of one of those middle tanks into the Elk River and contaminated the drinking water <laughs> supply of 300,000 people because this tank was just a mile and a half up, upstream from the Charleston intake. And this was the result in places like Elkview, West Virginia, where people were getting whatever containers they had um, and waiting in line um, to get water out of these distribution tanker trucks. Um, we saw people panic, understandably. I mean, something we take for granted, and turning on the tap, when that's suddenly not there. I mean, how, how do we react? Um, we buy all the bottled water we can, <laughs> because again, we know we need this to survive. The water crisis also exposed some of the inequalities, the inequities we see around access to clean water. Um, this is Lucretia Rose out, out, out uh, Cabin Creek in, in Eastern Kanawha County and she could not get to one of those distribution centers. So here she is with, with her Tupperware and buckets um, catching melting snow off of her, her roof so that she could bathe her two young sons. The water crisis also showed us the connection between clean water and public health. I mean, these were some of the common symptoms that people exposed to that chemical were experiencing rashes, also respiratory problems, vomiting, diarrhea, um, problems with um, eyes from exposure. The other thing it showed us is the direct link between water and our economy. Because when there was a failure to take care of the water that um, provided to the place like the city of Charleston, um, it shut the city down, brought it to its knees for days. Schools were out for weeks. Um, so, the social and political aspect was astounding too. This was three days into the water crisis, and I'll never forget it because it was a hot, crowded um, elementary school highway, hallway in downtown Charleston, and none of us had had a, sh you know, these folks didn't have a shower for three days, and we're frightened, and we're angry, and we're asking how could this happen? Who, who let us down here? And, you know, it, it was, I think, an awakening for a lot of people that we need to get involved. You know, we can't assume that the government is just taking care of us. We have to get active. And it was, again, remarkable to see people gathering in the basements of, of churches in, West, in Charleston during that time, saying, meeting people, networking with people they've never met with this common interest of, of you know, being victims of a poisoning, a contamination event, but also collectively seeing we need to get together and we need to hold our government to account. In terms of West Virginia Rivers Coalition's role, um, it was a huge opportunity for policy reform because this contamination event happened on the second day of the legislative session. And I know of at least four legislators themselves who had to seek medical treatment because suddenly like they were personally affected. And what a difference that I believe that made. Um, so within 11 days, and this was when Evan was working with us as, as a science advisor, he played a huge role in this. Um, this was one of the reports, we, the first report that we put out that talked about what, what, did, what can we learn from the freedom industry's uh, chemical leak. What went wrong here? Were there um, gaps? and information sharing in the law that we could address. Where did the failures happen? And we found out that they happened on several levels in several different ways. But what could we do from a policy perspective is what we focused on. And, and 
were very successful. I mean, it was a win for clean water. It was a win for the citizens of West Virginia who depend on public water. And as we were advocating for this inside the chambers, the difference was we had these folks outside of the chambers, right? There was presence, there was a force. <laughs> there was a force where lawmakers knew that the public was watching. Actually, the nation was watching at that time. Um, what was West Virginia going to do different so that this didn't happen again? Because what came out of all this is a culture of, of lax regulation and um, pro industry pro-industrial polluters, kind of being a part of our, our narrative and, and reliance on extractive industries that have created um, environmental harms. Were we going to learn from this and rebound from this in, in a different way? Um, the, you know, the, the good news is that, yeah, we did for a time. I mean, the, there was a Senate Bill 373 that created for the first time an above ground storage tank regulatory program in West Virginia. We had the Public Water Supply Protection Act that now is still intact and still requires every public water system to have what's called a source water protection plan in place. So now all of our public water systems should know what the threats to the drinking water, upstream threats are to our drinking water intake, and should be having, having a plan to help manage those and deal with those and be prepared, better prepared, for a contamination event should it happen. Now, what we've been working on is what can we do more to prevent those from ever happening in the first place? And that's that source water protection piece. Um, so, and, and remarkably at that time, the Canal River in the middle of Charleston had been exempt from a very important policy called Category A, which I'm going to come back to. Um, and that e exemption was restored. So even in the Canal River, like things were looking good. Things were looking up. <laughs> Um, I will say, you know, as what I've seen in the last five years, and you've probably seen, been paying attention to knowing this group, is that, you know, as this crisis fades into memory, that it seems to go back to kind of the old ways and business as usual. And this above ground storage tank act at first intended to, and to regulate uh, about 45,000 above ground storage tanks that we have all across the state. And now we're down to somewhere between four and 5,000. So we, you know, 10% <laughs> around that is left of what's regulated. And that was year after year of industry and the regulated community coming back and lobbying for less regulation. So in 2014, the public and the legislators themselves were asking, how could this have happened? Where's the regulation? What do you mean we're not providing oversight to these tanks? And it was even just a year later that those same, those same lawmakers were saying, wait a minute, we might have went too far. We can't impede business, you know, we, have, we are job creators. We will, you know, and started chipping away about, uh, around um, the above ground storage tank and making exceptions and exemptions for who was under that. And it's now literally just a shell of what that law was um, back in 2014 in terms of the number of tanks that they oversee. Um, the other significant thing I've seen is, you know, we have a, a, a cold baron for a governor now, and he, this was published right before the 2016 election, I think, yeah, October 1st, 2016, where his settlement became public with the EPA for a $6 million settlement to settle 23,693 water quality violations <laughs> from the coal mines he owed. So. We have, you know, in place a, an executive leader who himself um, has has tens of thousands of water vi quality violations um, against his companies, um, and we also have in place things like an executive order ordering a, a moratorium on regulations. So there's an order in place from the Justice Administration that we're not to be creating any new regulations. In fact, there is um, a very strong sentiment among our political leadership, you know, less regulation. And, and I get concerned about that 
you know, I get concerned about this word regulation becoming a bad word because regulation is really about protection. That's the word we should be using because those regulations are in place to protect us. So the concern we've been trying to voice is, wait, not so fast. Like, let's think about this. Let's look at the science. Let's look at the public health concerns because are we making our people even more vulnerable by weakening regulations? And at, there are definitely instances where we would argue, yes, that is a, a very serious concern. I'm gonna go into, I think Julie mentioned um, what the hot topic of the session in terms of water was this year, which were the water quality standards. And Helen Gibbons, put that sheet in your packet. See, it's a great one-pager if you want to learn more about it. Um, but basically, where we ended up at the set, and I'm going to explain how we, how we got here a little bit. Um, and I go, well, where we ended up is that this, the, the state legislature decided not to make these recommended updates. And the reason they did that was pressure from chemical manufacturers to say, wait, this is going to have an impact on us. Um, we don't think the science is, we think the science is faulty or flawed. Um, we need, being the industry, we need more time to commission our own study to come up with our own data to bring you. Because we don't, we don't trust the government to do that. For, for you, you know, we, we know. So what happened was we've got essentially a two-year delay, another two-year process, I'm gonna show you the timeline, um, for further study of this issue. So it was, it was unresolved and that we're still with the status quo. We still are um, using water quality standards that were established in the 1980s that haven't been updated based on the best available science um, because of industry pressure. And just to explain quickly, water quality standards are, are really important. It's, been, it's something that our organization has worked on since our inception. Because they are the, they set the limits, they're the legal basis for setting the limits for controlling the amount of pollution that's allowed to be in our water. And they're reviewed every three years, called the Triennial Review. And so that's why they came before the legislature this year, because we're in this 2019 Triennial Review. And this human health criteria is what was on the table to be updated. That um, since the 1980s, EPA has been working on this for years and decades. Uh, to look at the best science, to look at what more we know about certain chemicals, what we know about risk factors. And they recommended 94 updates be made to water quality standards across the country. And DEP, our West Virginia DEP, took a long time to look at these. These, these EPA updates came out in 2015. DEP looked at, has been looking at them since then. And for this uh, session, what they recommended to the legislature this year was that West Virginia update 60 of our um, human health criteria to get up with the times, to get up, to catch up with the best available science. And human health criteria, think, I, I think of it, it's about what you would think it is, protecting human health. So it's about being able to eat the fish safely, being able to touch the water safely, and be able to, after conventional treatment, drink the water safely in a way that's not going to harm us, or at least provides a low enough risk, and I think that's going to be part of the policy debate. Um, it is part of the policy debate, is how much risk are we, are we is okay, <laughs> um, in terms of things like being exposed to carcinogens and some of these other very harmful substances that can make us sick and kill us. Um, just a basic understanding of how they're calculated. There are a few things that go into this. These are probably the most familiar with us, is body weight. So body weight plays a factor in what levels are determined. The idea being if, if you are heavier, you can assimilate or can accept more pollution. Goes into fish consumption. How much fish do we eat? It kind of provides a pathway to exposure. And how much water do we drink? 
And what, what EPA found is as a nation, we weigh more, but we're also eating more fish and we're also drinking more water. So that all has to be taken into account in addition to um, the nature of the chemicals and, and what they can do to our body. Um, something just interesting to know, um, when EPA recommended their updates, they based them on national uh, rates, like the fish consumption rate nationally is 22 grams per day. That's the national average of how much fish we eat. Um, DEP had a study commissioned in 2008 that showed West Virginians only eat 9.9 .9 grams per day. So less than half the national average. And, you know, I ask, well, why is that? Why do I not eat the fish? <laughs> and it's because I know that there is a fish consumption advisory on every river and stream in West Virginia. The fish are contaminated here. Um, but this becomes rationale for increasing pollution. Because West Virginians aren't eating as much fish, we're not as exposed, so we can allow more pollution in the rivers and streams. So you see the kind of circular logic, <laughs> and it led to I don't, this is you know led to some humor um, from a, a comedian and storyteller Bill Lepp out of Charleston. Uh, when the Manufacturers Association they did submit in their comments suggesting that because West Virginians, because remember. Um, this difference, West Virginians eat less fish. Well, they also you know, recommended the state look at, well, West Virginians weigh more than the national average. Another reason why to weaken those limits. So here, Bill Lepp's take on that is your mom is so fat she can drink West Virginia water and still not get cancer. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm gonna mention something because this is, I, I predict this is going to come up in this next iteration of the review of water quality standards. It's come up in the past. Something called category A that everybody needs to know about. It's a, um, it's a good policy that West Virginia has in place around category A. Category A is the designated use around public drinking water. So this category in West Virginia right now applies to nearly every river and stream with just a few exceptions um, because the policy is about protecting not only current use, making um, where the intakes are now meet the requirements for being able to provide safe drinking water, but it also plans for future use. Wow, what a concept, like plan for the future and have options in the future where we could have rivers and streams that are safe enough to use as drinking water supplies. And it controls a lot of the, uh, these kind of chemicals that if they're found in our drinking water at certain levels, um, are very dangerous. And what we've seen proposed in the past, and what I expect could come back in the next couple years, is the um, industries wanting to limit the application in a, in a very drastic way. So instead of applying it everywhere so we can, we can plan for the future, they just want to look at what's existing. Where are those existing intakes? And let's just remove, let's keep them a half mile upstream from existing intakes, and let's remove them for everywhere where else. And that would, in essence, remove that protection for 99.9% .9 of rivers and streams miles in West Virginia. So I'm not kidding you <laughs> that this could be a possibility. It's been tried before. It's been talked about a long time. And the results would be more toxins statewide, and it just destroys that option for, for future use. So the timeline ahead for this water quality standards piece that I hope you all will remain engaged on, uh, and this was in the bill that passed that didn't have the updates in it, it did provide this timeline. So we know what's ahead of us, and we know we have an idea of how we're going, we're going to, there's a lot of work ahead. Because <laughs> um, by October, DEP is to receive all this information and new data that the Manufacturers Association asked for. They wanted more time to do their own study. DEP is going to look at that, and by April 20th, they're going to file a new proposal, and that will open a new public comment period. July, by July 2020, they'll have to file that final rule with the Secretary of State, and usually around November um, is when it will f hit its first legislative committee, the Legislative Rulemaking Committee, Review Committee, and then it'll be in front of the full legislature for consideration again 
in January 2021. And it's going to be essential for us and you and all, all of us to be involved every step of the way. Um, so we have, we've had an existence for a while, what we call the Water Policy Work Group that the League and Helen Gibbons has sat on, Julie sits on it as well. Um, we meet monthly, we're a team, we, we, we're a network of um, organizations and experts who work on that science piece, that re research and science piece, and to inform the public of what's happening. So we're in a fundraising mode now because we weren't expecting this, right? This was, this was not in the budget <laughs> or the work plan um, until it passed the legislature this year. So we've kind of got different, a, a strategy here that if we're able to raise that money, and some of this is already going, because in my mind, we've, we've just got to get started. We can't get behind, is um, we have to get a good grasp on the science methodology that EPA used to make these recommendations so we can communicate those to the public, to the um, decision makers. We know that this, manu this um, Manufacturers Association study will be filed and, and we're gonna need our own experts to, to unpack that and look at that in detail and be able to provide a response to that. Um, what we want to do a lot more of is understand the public health implications if we fail to act on these updates. So we don't have that in-house expertise. We're going to have to hire that out and have some ideas of how, how we might work on that over the summer um, to bring public health expertise um, and explanation to people. That's, I mean, some of those chemicals you saw are um, things, some we've heard of, some we can't even pronounce, but there are people who understand that exposure causes more cancer. And we know we're, we have the fifth highest uh, cancer death rate in the nation. I mean, there's something going on in West Virginia that puts us more at risk for cancers. And could this be a contributor? Um, the other thing we want to make sure is we're communicating this well, okay? That we're communicating the science and the facts well and, and parsing out what those key policy questions are going to be. It's not just about, oh, if we pass this, this chemical plant may shut down. Maybe, you know, those maybes or those what ifs or those hypotheticals that are working from the political angle, you know, aren't where we want to be. We want to be, to be able to, to really challenge lawmakers on what is the decision they're making? What is the, the, that amount of risk they're willing to put in place when it comes to the citizens of that state? And make sure they understand the gravity of these decisions and the facts. And, and last, one thing we're always committed to, and I hope you all are on our lists, and I'll show you how to get on there if you're not, um, but back to the water crisis and what came of that, it's, it's public participation. And there's going to be plenty of opportunity for that in that timeline I showed you. So we're going to, through our, our newsletters and action alerts, keep everyone informed and, and be able to provide those um, real-time kind of op opportunities, decision points where citizen voices are going to make the difference. OK. How am I doing on time? Uh-oh. I'm going to start speeding up then and just run. And that was it on water quality standards. I, we want to save time for questions. And you've got a delegate here who is heavily involved in that too. But let me just fly through some of the other um, top line issues we're dealing with. Um, we're part of the Choose Clean Water Coalition. That is around the Chesapeake Bay drainage. Last month, we took a contingent to meet with our congressional members, both Shelley Moore Capito and Joe Manchin, um, agreed to support an increase in funding of the Chesapeake Bay program, which um, provides right now $3.6 million a year to the state of West Virginia for watershed improvement protection projects. Um, and if, if with their support, that could increase significantly. So we're excited about that. Um, Orsenko, anybody heard of Orsenko? Okay, you have? You got it. See, we did a, we did a little uh, folk or a, a little poll because we figure people don't know what this means. And you can see what they thought it meant. Asian food, small town in Europe, biker gang, that 
<laughs> sounds like a disease or bacteria were some of the responses we got. And so, you know, another reminder, we need to be explicit in our language. And, and now it is that, what she said, um, the Ohio River Pollution um, Sanitation Commission, Ohio River Valley Sanitation Commission. But what they're doing right now is um, proposing a, re a revision to the pollution control standards. Or Sanko came together as a multi-state compact to say, we need to work on a river like the Ohio together because we need something, a uniform standard that all the states abide to. And they, the proposal on the table is to keep those in place but to make them voluntary. Um, so in a moment, I'm gonna, the public comment period is open for this until Monday. The other public comment period open right now is another big deal. <laughs> um, it's a revision to the Clean Water Act, which is really the basis of everything and in terms of the legal framework that um, helps protect our water and improve them as well. And the Trump administration recently put out a proposed revision to redefine the definition of what waters of the US, of what waters fall under the Clean Water Act. And one, what it proposes is eliminating what are called ephemeral streams or headwater streams and isolated wetlands. And this could have um, a disproportionate effect on West Virginia because we are a headwater state, you know. Water in the Chesapeake Bay, water in Ohio starts in our mountains. Um, so to take action on both of this, this is our homepage. And we have two action alerts by April 15th. One on the Ohio River, one on the Clean Water Act definition. So we've hopefully made it easy for people just to click, go to the homepage at wvrivers.org, click on either of those, and it'll take you to a step-by-step -step instruction that you can file your comment within two minutes. Um, the good news is on, you know, when, when we talk to people, different audiences around West Virginia, and we do polling, clean water is way up there in terms of issues. The headwaters we were just talking about at risk, people get it. I mean, people believe the government should be active in protecting those. When it comes to our public lands and waters and why people, how they prioritize them, they prioritize them for clean streams, for drinking water, fish habitat, and recreation much more than they prioritize for gas drilling or, coal mi or mining. We did this survey in March 2015, so not too, about a year after the water crisis. So um, we had some strong feelings then <laughs> that over 90% think that water should be a higher priority and that a large a majority also that West Virginia wasn't doing enough to protect water. This was interesting when we asked who who do you listen to? <laughs> who, who are the effective messengers when we're trying to advocate for policies? And environmental advocates are like halfway down the list. <laughs> you know, so this is important in terms of building those creative alliances and constituencies. Water you, users, like breweries, these guys are effective messengers, right? Um, health professionals, that's why we're trying to raise that money to get more health professionals on board with this water quality standard issues. Professors, teachers, researchers, um, you know, last is industry reps and government officials. Not so much trust there. So I thought that was interesting. A couple other um, remarkable things. I know we have some Eastern Panhandle folks in the room. I mean, the, the whole phenomenon of rock wool is just blowing my mind. And it's just been incredibly fascinating to watch um, the energy there. And um, for the first time that I've been watching West Virginia politics over the past two years, I saw two elections that were decided basically on an environmental platform, environmental issue. Never seen that before with um, Delegate Doyle and Delegate Brown. Um, they attribute their, their victories and their elections, and they had major swings from the last time that Sammy Brown run, won, was because of their commitment to um, addressing environmental concerns around this facility and the voters coming out and supporting them and voting for them. Um, this was earlier this week in Morgantown. Um, do y'all see this in front of the Waterfront <laughs> Hotel? They're, the Manufacturers Association was having their uh, conference to promote the proposed Appalachian Storage Hub and um, got some coverage here in the, the Dominion Post. 
Um, we don't have time to go into this, but it's another uh, proposal to, uh, you know, these stars represent different kind of major industrial facilities, cracker plants. Uh, from here all the way into here is a proposed underground storage area. So, you know, if this comes to be, and, and we have our political leaders right now are very much proponents of this idea, They're, um, the, the, the folks behind this are saying this will create 100,000 jobs if we're able to pull this, this new hub or petrochemical complex here in West Virginia. Um, so there is there is a lot of political might and um, from the president of the United States <laughs> um, to to our to our governor um, and and uh, congressional representatives wanting to see this happen. Um, but again, you know, I'm seeing this kind of emergence of people saying, "Well, wait a minute. <laughs> what about our health? What about some of the concerns? Are we moving too fast on this kind of development? Is this kind of development the future of our state?" So just to end up here with a few things, more things you can do. I showed you how to get uh, to our action alerts. Um, we also have a volunteer monitoring program. This was a training we did in partnership with DEP uh, last weekend in Canal State Forest, where we got in the stream and learned about stream bugs and what they can tell us about stream health. Um, these volunteers are also helping us with a pipeline monitoring program. I mean, we've got three major pipelines resulting in over 3,000 stream crossings, and we're seeing um, quite a bit of damage, sedimentation happening from these major earth disturbing um, uh, activities. Our volunteers are the eyes on the ground that are helping point DEP in the direction of where the follow-up is needed. It's been a good partnership in that way. We've seen some action being taken. Unfortunately, it's usually when it's too late and the damage is already done, but we still think when these pipeline companies know that we're watching them and they're being held accountable, that they will do better um, with their construction practices. We also coordinate a campaign around public lands. Um, it, we had an incredible success, another just remarkable example of people getting involved last year uh, with the proposal to start commercial, open our state parks to commercial logging. Um, we had over 38,000 people, well, 38,000 letters written to the legislature opposing that. They did back off of that proposal that was supported by the governor. Um, and again, I mean, just shows this is the folks in Pocahontas County on a very cold blizzardy day <laughs> that came together to do a letter writing campaign because they weren't going to let you know, their beloved Watoga State Park uh, change in any way or become a, a source of commercial logging. Um, currently on na the national scale, we've got Senator Manchin who is championing the funding of something called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That news just came out, needs to go through Congress, but it's looking good. It's provided close to $250 million to West Virginia to be able to support public lands acquisitions and access points um, and, and also help with our state parks and, and also municipal swimming pools. It's done a lot of things. Oh, we've <laughs> we've started a, a safe water for West Virginia program where we are talking bringing together people around the idea of drinking water safety um, bringing community groups watershed groups agencies together to figure out how we can um, implement those source water protection plans I mentioned working with the DEP they have watershed based plans we're trying to you know find ways to collaborate and leverage resources where we're doing we're improving watersheds while we're also providing safer drinking water supplies um, we have a new campaign that's just emerging around looking at water and climate and in our changing climate Oop. and um, working on bringing that home to West Virginia you know what what are climate a changing climate and those impacts going to mean and our meaning and going to mean for us here back home and and what can we do to prepare for that or what can we do to to be a part of the solution around addressing climate change I'm going to skip through all this but basically the message is this is from Flint Michigan this is from Charleston West Virginia <laughs> um, where, where there's much I'm seeing much more of this this idea that you know water security 
is a crisis in this country, certainly worldwide, but in West Virginia, we have nine public water systems that have been on boil water advisories for five years or more. <laughs> there was one in O'Toole, West Virginia, also in the Southern coal fields. They just announced that they have released their boil water advisory after 17 years. These people didn't have water. Um, here, I mean, uh, the point of this slide was just to um, reiterate that relationship and connection to water. This is from Morgantown. Every time I look at people on that rail trail, I get excited because they're connecting with a river. And so many of our towns have this, you know, so it's, it's helping people understand it, that, that water is a part of their everyday lives in so many ways and that we need them. We need the public involved to help bring the policy and science um, to, to fruition and create policies based on sound science. But the only way that happens is with people. So I'm going to stomp here. This is one of my favorite people who I'm sorry she wasn't here today. But Helen, if you're out there, are you? Hi, Helen. Everybody, let's give Helen Gibbons a hand. <laughs> Helen, your natural resources chair, again, has been just an unwavering advocate for clean water. She stays so informed. She helps Jonathan be informed about when it's time for the league to sign on to letters. We really appreciate the league's support. It goes noticed. It makes a difference. It's been an incredible partnership. It made me like want to be more involved with you all, want to become a member. So. There I am, a pleasure being here. I'm sorry I went so long. We want time for questions, especially while we have the delegate here as well. So thank you all. <laughs> Do you want to facilitate something? Or, or Evan, do you want to make some remarks now? Or, <laughs> what do you want to do, John? You're in charge. Uh, yeah. I mean, Evan, I mean, yeah, I can make some, yeah. Well, I think I know most everybody here, but for those that don't know me, um, I'm a delegate from here in Mon County and just got elected in November. And like Angie said, I've worked with the West Virginia Rivers Coalition for many years, and I'm proud to have been associated with them and to continue to be associated with them. I think they're, they're a unique organization in West Virginia. Nobody else is doing what they're doing. Um, and it's, it's been kind of eye-opening to see things from another perspective now being in the legislature. It is a pretty hostile environment uh, for some of these issues, as, as you might imagine. Um, you know, I, when it became known that I was an environmental consultant, there was a delegate from the uh, Parkersburg area who came up to me. And Parkersburg is, is well known for the pollution from C8, from the production of Teflon that's caused a lot of problems there. But he, he made it a point to come up to me and tell me that he's drank thousands of gallons of C8 water and he's perfectly healthy. You know, so that's, that's the kind of attitude that is down there. I mean, how, how can the stuff that's in the water in such low concentrations possibly cause problems? No matter what the scientists say, you know, I'm still alive. So, and the, the big water issue this session was related to the water quality standards that Angie talked about at the beginning. And that was really a roller coaster. Um, you know, it, it had a, a good proposal from the state DEP which then got stripped out and then it got put back in when, when people came to a committee meeting in the Senate and we had a public health expert there um, together with the person who oversaw the effort in, in DEP and they were given a chance to answer some good questions from the senators and the senators unanimously put those protections back in. Um, but then when it went to the second Senate committee, there was no time for questions and answers. Uh, there was just a deal struck behind the scenes, and they took them back out. And then when it came over to the House, um, we tried to restore them. I proposed an amendment when it came through the House Energy Committee, um, which didn't pass. And then we also 
try it on the House floor, ultimately. Neither of those passed. Um, so it is a challenging environment, but it is really important, like Angie said, to have to have scientists and people who really understand this policy to be engaged. And, and it takes resources to do that. Um, Rivers Coalition does a whole lot with a very small budget. And uh, unlike similar organizations in other states that have large endowments and can rely on things like that, um, that's not the case. Everything in West Virginia is a little bit smaller. <laughs> um, so they, they do a lot of great work on a small budget. So that was all I had to say. I don't know what you have in mind, but um, I'm sure Angie or either of us would take questions. Well, I, I thought one of the interesting slides was that what 90% of people surveyed thought that water quality, why isn't that translating into the political? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why isn't it? 90% of people want to see stronger yeah. protection. Why isn't that um, translating into the political decision? I think it's they, they're not there. They're not at the Capitol for, for good reason. I mean, people have jobs and people have lives, but you look at who's there every day lobbying, and it's the, you know, the associations, you know, it's the Coal Association and the Manufacturers Association and the Oil and Gas Association. That's who has a presence there day after day after day. You gotta be, you gotta be there. And then from time to time, like when the uh, when the severance tax reduction bill was up for the, the coal severance tax reduction, um, one of the coal companies bust a couple hundred coal miners down and they filled the galleries, you know? So who's busting down a few hundred people who are concerned about clean water? It's just not happening. Well, and if it could happen too, like during campaigns, um, you know, we saw the, the what Jefferson County and the Rockwell and how that played a role. I, I get the sense, and, and I think you hear it from your constituencies in Mon County, but I don't know that um, candidates are really hearing that clean water is a priority. Well, is that fair? It's a little hard to say. I mean, it's something that I've always talked about on my campaign because I've been involved in the issue, and it's something... I care about, and I've seen the polls too, and I believe them to be true, that people really do care about that and that it is a top tier issue for people. So I talk about it, but a lot of candidates are scared to talk about issues like that because they feel like they, they feel like it's a losing issue. Even though it, it polls well and people truly are concerned about it, they're concerned about the big money that's gonna go to their opponents to get their opponents elected. So. Which Leads me to put a plug into Citizens for Clean Elections, led by Julie Archer. I mean, really looking at campaign finance reform and the role of money and in influencing elections and the decisions that lawmakers make. I mean, we need coalitions like the ones Julie is leading and the candidate forums that you all are doing. So, and so important, so important. Mm -hmm. Are you at all involved with the fracking industry? And what it's doing to the clean water. Uh, Jonathan and I went to a, an all-day conference in Pittsburgh about four or five months ago, and there were doctors there who were explaining that uh, a fracking pool, if, if it's within a mile of someone's home, could cause cancer in children. And it's a very serious problem, and I didn't know what you'd uh, do with that. <laughs> Well, we, you know, our organization was involved early on with that before I even came on board, and Julie worked hard on that first Horizontal Well Control Act um, to get some regulation in place, because they're essentially what this whole unconventional fracking thing, it was new to West Virginia, so we had to, our regulations had to catch up. Um, I mean, since... I, it's it's so immense and has so many tentacles and to to environmental and public health and climate change and I mean I mean there are so many aspects that I think are worth exploring more when we think about water we we are concerned about um, the the toxic waste that's involved in fracking I I feel like I, that's something I harp on because of the volume of it and. If things like the Appalachian Storage Hub or these pipelines get built and we're talking about more and more drilling, more and more production, we're talking about more and more waste, 
and I'm not seeing a very short, long-term plan, certainly, on how we're going to deal with that in a safe, responsible manner. Um, but Julie Archer is a great resource on all things fracking, and that, Evan's done a lot of research, too. You want to say anything about I mean, one, one of the things that we do, so this is not as a delegate, but just in my environmental consulting is test people's water if they're concerned about fracking nearby, um, or if they believe that contamination has already occurred. And it, it definitely does happen. I, I'm not convinced that people's water gets contaminated every time that, that there's drilling and fracking, but there are definitely documented cases um, cases that we've personally been involved in collecting the data on. Um, so it is of concern. And the other thing just about the scale of the industry, like Angie mentioned, we did a report a couple of years ago that looked at all the fracking operations across the state of West Virginia and how close they are to sensitive areas like homes and schools and hospitals and found that over time, as you might expect, there, there are many more fracking operations that are closer and closer to those types of areas. And that raises the question about whether the, the laws we have in place are good enough, the, the laws that require certain setbacks, um, whether those setbacks are appropriate or whether the legislature needs to revisit those. Actually, yeah. So we we decided yesterday to give you give your organization a big donation for that research, the Water Working Group. Oh my god! Yeah. So here you go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah. As uh, you heard, this comes at a critical time mm -hmm. where we really think we can get this right if we have those resources. So this this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially uh, hearing the challenges you all are dealing with <laughs> uh -huh. and just the same thing. How do we get people involved, mm -hmm. you know, and to see the commitment in this room and you all putting that in action means a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're very glad to be. <laughs> yeah, then we didn't, it wasn't hard to convince us. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, appreciate yeah. the partnership, yeah. appreciate you staying all involved and, uh, Oh, you want right, another? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> All Incredible. right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh huh.